Welcome back to another episode of our first responder program with Blomquist Hale. Uh, we've got a great panel today with us. Let's go around and introduce ourselves, starting with you, Josh. Yeah, my name is Josh Watcott. It's good to be back here again. I've been here at Blomquist Hale for a couple of years now, and uh, I have prior law enforcement experience and um, one of our clinicians here on our first responder team. Super. Rick. Hi, I'm Rick Ashby. I am a licensed clinician with Blumquist Hill. I work here part time. I am full time with uh, in law enforcement with the Unified Police Department. And uh, I don't know if I already said I've been with Blumquist Hill for about six years. Fantastic. Natalie. Hi, my name is Natalie Jensen. I am a therapist here with Blumquist Hill and part of our first responder team. Been with Blumquist Hill about eight years. And um, with that, I also um, work as adjunct faculty at UVU, Utah Valley University, and teach courses on substance use and addictions. Fantastic. And my name is Aaron Moon. I'm an Army veteran and former law enforcement. I'm also a clinician here at Blomquist Hale. Uh, all of these fine folks <clears throat> are on our uh, clinical first responder team. Um, and I'm the director of our first responder team. Today, we'd like to uh, discuss a little bit about how uh, numbing out becomes an issue, particularly, it can, it can happen to anybody, but in the first responder world, we see it quite a bit. Uh, I've asked Natalie to present some questions uh, for us in, who've been prior first responders, and Rick currently still is, and uh, just kind of have a, a roundtable discussion about how these things impact us and our families. So with that, take it away, Natalie. Thank you. Well, I think a good place to start is, why do you think first responders have this desire or this need to numb after a long shift, a long, difficult call that might be a little different than the general population. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, I'm going to go one step further on that and say, I don't even, I don't see it as a need to numb after a given shift. I see it as a need to numb in general. And I think it's cumulative. I think it's uh, the the experiences over years, not just over hours, that create that. Uh, and uh, it's a good question as to why. I think that uh, the the traumatic experiences that we have and uh, the way we deal with it, the intrusions that we experience because of those traumas play into that need to do something to get away, to escape those intrusions. Uh, and when I say intrusions, just things that trigger us uh, to think and feel things that are uncomfortable, the things that we do not want to feel and finding ways not to have to feel that uh, is, it, it, tend, it tends to become a priority in a lot of our lives. How we go about doing that can vary from one person to the next, but I have found that there's, uh, you know, a handful of ways that uh, most first responders it will the, the, they gravitate to certain certain activities that uh, will help them do that and, and tend to be really effective in the short term, and tend to be very problematic in the long term. Right. <clears throat> um. Numbing out is, uh, it's a really great question, Natalie. Uh, it, there's a lot of reasons why uh, people uh, that I've seen myself, or I've done myself, and I've seen with uh, friends and coworkers and that, but it is kind of like the buildup of a lot of compartmentalization and not feeling like, for me, um, I, I felt like being stoic was a, uh, and to me being stoic means I'm not sharing uh, what is uh, troubling. And, uh, and that because number one, I, I feel like I'm still protecting other people by not talking about it. And uh, number two, I didn't want to revisit it. Uh, so it's just kind of like hold it in 
and uh and that becomes kind of like a trigger in and of itself to to look for reasons to escape into my own mind or to not think about uh anything and just uh feel like uh I, don't, I have no more responsibility right now in that so how about you josh i think mine came from a lot of that as well just the fact of the fact of you know like we've talked about many times on our podcast hyper vigilance and you know being able to just get away from some of that and and kind of feel normal again i guess if you will whatever normal is but <laughs> in the first responder world it's just it's it's so much chaos, so much uh, trauma, so many different things. And, you know, for me too, I think a lot of it came with, you know, like you said, being a stoic and being this rigid individual and I have to act a certain way and I have to behave these certain ways in, the, in this uniform. And, you know, we screw up too. And so some of that uh, with me spending, you know, time on the SWAT team and many different portions, uh, detectives and all of that, you know, making ex making mistakes was really difficult for me to accept. I wanted to be this perfect individual. And, you know, there's these, you have to be this way and you have to do this. And so uh, for me, a lot of it too was making those mistakes and, and, and being comfortable with making mistakes. And, you know, it was okay that I'm a human being, I can feel this way. And so what I would do is, yeah, move towards alcohol, some of these other things and be able to feel normal and numb myself out and forget about some of these events. Uh, Right. And that was the one time where I felt where you feel good. You can be yourself. You can and and that's really kind of how I turned down a road that wasn't so great. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like when we numb out, it's like <clears throat> I want to feel something. But then in the course of if you're like using a substance such as alcohol or uh even prescription painkillers or something like that. We actually, in in the search of uh, trying to feel something, we actually become numb and somewhat paralyzed. And uh, this impacts our relationships. Um, it may not uh, the first time or the second time or the third time you do it, but over a course of period of uh, time. And that this can be very problematic. And um, I think part of the problem, too, is not having people uh, that you feel comfortable kind of offloading things with. Um, <clears throat> and so that's why uh, we want to be uh, your force multiplier with uh, being able to safely come uh, talk to us. Uh, we're capable and willing and want to be of service to uh, our first responder audience here and your families. What else you got, Natalie? Well, so you, you know, you've all kind of alluded to some of the ways that, that first responders do numb. What are the common ways that you've seen people will numb? After, you know, Josh, you talked about this need to be perfect. And if I failed somehow, you know, I don't want to deal with that. So I'm going to do use something else to help avoid that emotion. What are ways that you've seen people will will try to numb? You, you've mentioned alcohol. Um what else? The probably the most obvious outward uh, response I've seen amongst uh, first responders is spending money. <laughs> and I say that outward because you can if if you're using alcohol to numb, you can hide that. You can hide that for a long time. Uh, it often gets pretty bad before it peaks its head uh, like at work and things like that. You got to be pretty far down the road when uh, it, 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 you know, most first responders aren't making, we are not on the high end of the, the, uh, the pay scale as far as uh, professions that <laughs> one, one a person might have in the United States. Uh, but when you, I, I often see amongst our crowd, uh, a lot of toys, you know, we're talking about uh, big dollar items, uh, things like four wheelers, boats, campers, trucks. Like that. What's that? Trucks. trucks. Well, you, if you're going to buy a camper, you got to have a <clears throat> camper uh, and whatnot. And there's a lot of rationale for having these things, but this Motorcycles. is recycles. Yeah, like Harley's <laughs> and things like that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and going into debt for those things. Right. You know what I'm saying that is because this is the thing. I know this 
to be the case because you don't hide those things. You want people to know about those things. So I see this uh, amongst our population quite a bit, the, the, the toys, and then the discussions that come along about the debt that we are now in because of those toys and how we are dealing with the debt, which is usually to work more uh, to be able to pay off the debt. But how did we get in the debt in the first place? Why, what was the motivation? And often when I have these conversations, with people, they will rationalize it in one way, but when we start to really get deep into how did we get here, it is to feel something, to feel something that's not what I am normally feeling. Right. There's an excitement. There's an excitement about there that new truck or that very new Very much an excitement mm -hmm. about it. It's like you're offering yourself up, and particularly with the motorcycles. And I'm not, boy, I'm not bagging on motorcycles and and that and the, and the crowd. But there is a lifestyle that comes along with the motorcycle. The what they the idea that we want from that to be able to get out on that uh, motorcycle, wind in our hair, if we have any, and uh, be able just to hit the road and go. You know what I'm saying? And to run away from whatever it is, even if it's for a little while. This is what it is. If you think about all the other toys, to get out on the water, to get out into the woods, to That's go away. One, you know? one of the things too that, also happens is it may not be the first responder that's uh, buying all this stuff. They may be working a lot to uh, just pay things off and their spouse becomes the shopper uh, because uh, they're lonely and, and that because they're being ignored. And then that becomes a vicious cycle with uh, then the first responder saying, well, I got to I got to make up uh, for all your spending habits. And then this becomes a complication in the um in the marriage uh with uh that's it's like a tiptoe it's not like something super obvious right up front but kind of looking in retrospect and that the spouse is spending too much and then the the first responder is working too much be, and then the spouse spends more because there's there's no connection happening these things do tend to spin up very slowly over years and yeah. you're absolutely right. It's generally in hindsight that people start to see how big a problem this became. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Josh? Yeah, I think the numbing continues, right? You, you continue to stay at work. You continue to have to work. And if you're having problems in your relationship, why not keep going to work? And now I got to buy these toys for my family. So there's always an excuse. Well, <laughs> I have to because I got to pay for all these things when in reality, yeah, they're making a big disconnect with the relationships because of it, too. Yeah. But you see things like the gym too. I mean, we talk about being healthy and all those type of things. And you see, you see uh fire and police and getting wrapped up into having to work out every day for two hours or an hour every single day and all weekend. And you know, it begins to take their life over and they just lose connections with people. So you can see it in a lot of different ways where we choose to numb. Some that we say, Oh, this is a healthy way to do it. I'm working out, but yeah, now it's yeah. affecting and all these types of things that we've been talking about so while we were talking i gave uh or i started writing a list and extreme activities was actually at the top of my list and extreme <laughs> activities can be anything from i'm going to call it excessive gym going uh i get we get a lot of people who are involved in these days in mma fighting uh, and uh, that is a, the, you know, the, rela the the rationale is, hey, this is very applicable to what I do on the street, but uh, it's still an extreme sport and it can go to excess often enough. Uh, mountain biking, mountain, you know, rock climbing, all sorts of extreme sports that I see people, particularly the younger crowd uh, in, in public safety will get involved in because again, it gives them a lot of excitement. It gives them extreme feelings that can help mask those other feelings they don't want to feel. Which sometimes we see first responders, right? Looking for uh, riskier, higher risk type activities and hobbies. Yep along with some of that yeah for the numbing effect to some degree but yeah just because i mean i was a motor cop forever so i had to get a motorcycle once i got out. <laughs> you got an excuse <laughs> <laughs>
Right on. Well, uh, we haven't brought it up, but I was going to throw out sex goes into this yeah. uh, a certain level of excitement, particularly when it's uh, outside of you know the norm or what may not be fully appropriate, and that is just as cloaking for those uh, uncomfortable feelings we don't want to feel, and is extremely problematic for personal yeah. relationships. Right. Well, in um. Let's uh, kind of wrap up with closing thoughts from the panel. And uh, so let's start with kind of like, Natalie, you've asked us a lot of great questions. Um, what are your thoughts in closing here? Well, it's, to me, it sounds like three S's, spending, sex, substances, <laughs> right? Um, not always, you know, and some of them are, are more, um, you know, I, I, I don't see a lot of people coming in for counseling because they're spending too much time at the gym unless it's having an impact on their relationship. We're seeing more people coming into their office because of the spending and the sex, right? If that, the impact that's having on relationships, if there's infidelity involved and substances when it becomes problematic. And those are, that's maybe a, a continued discussion is when does it, when do we start to say, this is maybe having an impact? When does it change from a healthy outlet to something that's having a negative impact? Nice. How about you, Rick? I think that, you know, everything we've talked about, I, someone might po pop into this video and go, I do those things and whatnot. And I see no problem. I believe that there is balance in all of these things. It's nice. not the activities themselves are not the issue. It's the excess at which we do those activities. That's the issue. But uh, the reason we go to those excesses is because we're not finding other ways to find that balance. So we don't have to go to the excesses. That is one of the great things about going to see a therapist is to help find the balance and in, uh, a broader range of your life so that you don't have to be finding those ways to deal with those uncomfortable thoughts and feeling those intrusions that we will inevitably have in this uh, field. Uh, it, we, we can find other ways to and other outlets and then utilize some of these other things that we've been talking about in a balanced way. Uh, to be to actually find fulfilling lives rather than to wreck our personal lives. Well put. How about you, Josh? You know, I think the thing that really made me kind of do a check in on myself was when you start hearing those people that you really love around you, such as your kids, such as other family members that care a great deal about you that say, gosh, you are just you're just not the, the same person you used to be. Here's the behaviors we're recognizing in you. Here's what we're seeing. We're, we notice you're drinking so much. You can't you can't show up to a function without having six beers. You know, whatever the case may be, that was a real wake up for call for me to to hear. You know, hey dad, gosh, you you drink a lot, yeah. and I think a time in my life where I really had to take a step back and go, is there really something going on here? And start, you know, and, and then, of course, I didn't even want to believe that it was me going, OK, I'll go in and see somebody and talk to a third party and explain, you know, be open and share some things. And let's see if I really if there's really a concern. And that's yeah. when my eyes really opened up. So listen to the loved ones around you. You know, if, if you know, hey, you're, you're being an asshole and you never were once before. And now look at you like li listen to those words and and start processing what really have some self-reflection about what is going on for me. And yeah. then like, get in and see somebody. That's why we're here. Come in, check in. Yeah. And that takes a whole lot of humility, which doesn't necessarily balance out with the the A-type personalities that kind of are attracted to the first responder field where it's like, nobody tells me what to do kind of a thing, uh, especially uh, my the outside people. And so I think that those are all really great things with being able to learn how to balance uh, know where your resources are, reach out to us. Uh, everything's confidential and uh, we'll walk the path with you. So I want to uh, thank our panel here today uh, for giving us some of your time to uh, reflect on uh, some of these things that we've been talking about on the, this very broad topic of uh, substances and how uh just the lifestyle that we choose starts with decisions that we're making that accumulate time after time again. Uh, I want to thank our audience 
for uh, giving us your time. And please join us again for another uh, episode of Bunkless Health First Responders. Thank you.